My name came when I did my major vision quests on Bear Butte. I had done four years of questing, one a one day near my home, Castle Rocks, near our ranch in Montana, uh, several more there, and then the final one was at a classic um, traditional fasting place. Fasting is the word we use for vision questing. A fasting place uh, in South Dakota near the Black Hills called Bear Butte. And there on Bear Butte, um, I received many visions, including one that gave me my name. My full name is Daughter of the Rainbow of the Morning Star Clan, whose helpers are the sun and the moon, and whose medicine is the eagle. And of course, I had to shorten it down just a bit. <laughs> The teaching came to me from, originally, from my own native elders, although I was not raised traditionally. When I was very young, uh, I was uh, in a half-breed ranching family there on the Crow Reservation, and we weren't very traditional. And, at the same time, the Native American ceremonies were federal offense illegal until 1972 or 3, uh, until the Native American Freedom of Religion Act, those ceremonies were illegal. So some of them were held in the back country, but often we were busy with our ranching and didn't get a chance to participate. So I didn't learn so much early on about the old time Native ways. Then in my um, late 20s, I was called home to study with a wonderful woman uh, in the tribe that my father had married into, the Cheyenne people. Her name was the woman who knows everything. And uh, actually her, that's what they called her. Her name was um, Josie Limpy, stands near the fire. And so I was called to spend time with her and learn from her. And under her is how I did my four vision quests. So that was the beginning of my learning, and then I stepped out into the world, and I've always been very much a rainbow person, I guess you would call it, uh, in modern terms, because I've been interested in much more than my small area, my small um, culture. Uh, I've always been fascinated by traveling, and my primary interest in some ways is what works for human beings. It's not what is somebody's idea of that in a small frame, which might be really excellent for those people, but I'm really interested in the things that work cross-culturally and what we're really about as a human family. So that sense of the, the wider look at things is what I've always been interested in. So I've spent time with Incan teachers and, uh, you know, looked at the pyramids in Egypt and, uh, you know, just every, looked at everything that I'm uh, drawn to, to see what is it that human beings could learn, could understand, that would actually make a difference. And actually I should go back very early on because one of my primary teachers uh, was always the Mother Earth. Being raised on a ranch like I was, uh, a self-sufficient ranch, five miles from another ranch, 10 miles from another little Indian village, 45 miles from a town. I spent most of my time on the land and with the animals and um, outside really connecting to the earth. And so I feel like the Mother Earth was my first and primary teacher. And I really fell in love with the earth there. Um, I really realized how beautiful the, the gift we've been given of this Mother Earth. And so I was raised there under a mountain made of quartz crystal. Um, the water that came out from it was beautiful, pure springs. And we lived a very simple life with horses, 
We traveled with horse and buggy. We ranched with our horses, including our farming and all of that was done with horses. We didn't have electricity or running water. So I lived very close to the land and learned to love that and love that simple life. So I feel like when I came out into the world and began teaching and people invited me to, to speak, um, what I carried that many people didn't have was that deep, deep connection with the earth and with the spirit alive in the earth, the richness of um, every individual animal being um, and the spirit that lived in all. So that was the beginning and interestingly enough it's extended out from there. I travel a lot and I feel very comfortable in the world so um, I seem to have fallen in love with the whole earth, not just one part of her. <laughs> you know, I think in primary cultures there was one, there was this deep, deep connection with the earth and, in a sense, the material world. But there was also a clear-eyed recognition of the spirit that lived in all things. So all was not only was there the sense of the material, but the spirit was recognized in, through, and behind, in a sense, everything. So from early on, there was you know, not so much um, division between spirit and matter. Um, it was seen as one continuum, one certainly more subtle than the other. Um, and for medicine people, and certainly in other cultures, the people called shamans, uh, there was always that sense that we could communicate and connect to that more subtle level that is the invisible world, and that it was important to do that, that there was much richness there. Uh, the, the patterns behind all the forms that are physical um, are there in those light bodies and in that subtle body. So there was always an interaction with that. And when I first went on Vision Quest, spirit is always active, the invisible is always active. But when we're so busy in the world doing things and focusing in the physical world, we don't have the, the space, literally, in our consciousness to pay attention to spirit. So the idea of Vision Quest, which is something I love to do for people to help them spend time in that quietness, the idea is that you leave behind everything you can leave behind. Hopefully it would be summertime and you'd be able to have light clothing on. You might take a, a blanket or a sleeping bag or whatever you need to be comfortable at night. And other than that, you don't have anything with you. So when you fast from activity, movement, talking, doing, it's like what's left is spirit. And in that quietness, spirit arises. And so visionary experience is much easier when we have, actually have the space to, to listen and to feel and to hear. So that's, that's really the process in a way of vision quest, is to begin to understand that. And the first vision quest is always what we call a knowledge quest. And Interestingly enough, the knowledge that you find is that it doesn't matter if you're naked and a thousand miles from anyone else. What you do is you carry it all in your head. And you can spend your whole time on a vision quest talking to yourself and running all the stuff that you carry. So part of the teaching is how to find the silence to drop away from even that all that that you carry inside yourself. But of course one of the most amazing pieces of knowledge is how much of that is going on all the time. Is that there's this constant play and constant talking and constant telling yourself, constantly creating. The old ones say we create our world out of that constant chatter. And so to become more conscious of that, to stop the world, 
to stop the chatter. I teach a technique called listening to the voice of silence that comes from the Toltec tradition. And that is specifically meant to stop that inner chatter. When that stops, there's a real opportunity to hear the more subtle voices. And it's certainly worth doing because uh, there's so much richness in uh, the subtle worlds uh, beyond, in, around, and through our physical world. And I think one of the most powerful things we can pay attention to is, I guess, what I would call the voice of the Great Mother. Because in all traditions, even certainly in science, modern science, there's the recognition that in the beginning was the void. There was this deep, dark nothingness. And out of that was birthed all things. Everything came forth from that. Well, if you use modern language, something deep, dark that births things is a womb. It's a feminine. So that's that sense of the great mother. And that great being, that great presence that the Lakota people call Wakan, that feminine womb that's the beginning of everything. The most powerful thing we can do is to drop deeply into our meditation and touch into that great wisdom, that intelligence that connects to each and everything, that lives in everything. And certainly we can find it in ourselves because we are made of that same love and light that was the original birthing of things. So a lot of what I've been doing recently is talking to women about their ability to touch that deep space, that kind of intelligence, that kind of power and potential. Because out of that void, out of nothingness, everything was created. <clears throat> and we as women have been given that same kind of womb. Out of that we create life into the world. And so to learn to touch back into the depth of that where we are receiving information that is absolutely pure and clear and, and real. It's not an intellectual thought. It's not an idea about something that we've made up from some experience. But touching deeply into that sense of the Great Mother and her intelligence, we're touching into the intelligence of life itself. And so when we receive our answers from there, when we call for solutions to the problems we have now in the world, from that place, the answers we receive are powerful, real, clear, and, um, and workable. So I think it's really important that we all find, you know, find the time and take the time to uh, deepen into our meditations and into the meditation with the great creator so that what we're bringing forth is actually workable. So many of the solutions I see today come out of somebody thinking, but often one of our challenges is that people today are not in contact with the real world. They live in a world of going from the house into the car, into the office, into the city, and that isn't the real world. The real world is how does this Mother Earth function? What is here? How does it work? How can we be in stewardship of that? And understanding that that is the vital piece. Because if we don't steward this real life here well, then we won't have a place to live on this sweet earth. So intellectual ideas about things are, I don't think, where we need to go now. We need to drop back into what I call the ancient brain, that, that deeper, deeper self beyond thinking and emotion, that deeper self that has connection with the wisdom of the ages, the deeper self, the deeper wisdom in the old brain 
that's what allows us to survive and be here in the first place. So that we're working with intelligence, not intellect. So spending time in that kind of a place, I think, pays enormous rewards. Well, first of all, the thing that we are going back to as women is an understanding, once again, of what's real in our lives, who we really are, how we function, literally in a physical manner, how our brain functions, how our hormones function, and how our bodies function. And, as I talk to people, how magical our bodies are. Creator made these bodies, not as some dull thing to keep us from being spiritual, but to be alive and spiritual in them, to manifest the incredible possibilities we have into the physical world. And one of those magics is that women, when they are natural women, in the sense that they are paying attention to the moon, and putting their eyes in moonlight, as we know, the moon guides and moves the cycles of water, the rhythm of water and tide, and as well, it guides the rhythm and tides of a woman's blood. And so, when a woman is paying attention, having her eyes in the moonlight, and is willing to take the time at the dark of the moon, that's when she normally will have her menses. That's a time of quieting, when women are truly healthy and taking care of themselves, they take time off during that time. More and more, our businesses and our uh, world will recognize that it's vitally important to give women that time so that they can be healthy and continue to be the amazing, uh, you know, make the amazing offerings they do in the world. Everything from birthing children and taking care of them to being brilliant scientists and everything else. So that time when women quiet themselves at the dark of the moon during their menses, that time is when the connection, if you will, to the Great Mother, to the Great Intelligence, to the depth of what's real and what has been down through time, that connection is the, the closest in the woman in that state. And so, it's incumbent upon us as women to use that time and to use that power that's been given us, that rich connection that we have been given to, uh, to serve. We not only take that time off to rest and heal ourselves and renew, a woman's life is 24-7 most of the time, especially when she has children. So she needs that four days to rest and take care of herself and renew. And she also does that in service of her people, because to touch into the connection with that great intelligence means that um, great creativity, great uh, inspiration, uh, vision. Um, many women who already probably have the capability of being uh, much more in connection with spirit than some of us uh, become great visionaries through that practice. It's a continual month after month after month after month after month after month after month practice of deepening into spirit, of connecting and asking, Great Mother, what is it that I can bring through my beingness, my womb, my energy, to serve my people? That practice, when deepened, brings us incredible visionaries and seers and uh, you know, creativity and richness and uh, so much. So, out of that place, then, I think women can lead in the world in just a remarkable way, because it's not trying to figure things out. It's getting in connection with the great life that lives everything. And that's what I call power. It, power isn't about forcing and pushing things and 
changing things and well Mother Earth didn't do it right so we'll fix this and change that and kill this and and destroy that and build that. It's really not about that. It's about how can we tune in to the rich, deep, profound and beautiful intelligence that is offered us through our bodies, through our world, through spirit, you know, through the subtle and invisible. Tune into that. Then we can have some solutions that make a difference. So it's that calling that forward and offering it into the world where women's leadership can really shine. Because our leadership can't be just about acting masculine, pushing and shoving the world. It's not about going out there and putting on a business suit and becoming better at being a guy than the guys. I mean, women have shown that they can probably do that. There are women out there just shining and doing incredible work. And many of them have even lost their menses through the stress they face. And they haven't touched that part of them that is uniquely feminine and uniquely powerful. So that deepening into our wisdom, finding the feminine aspect of the world, which is not about competition and conquering and being better than or getting more than, touching into that feminine space, which is like a good mother, about nurturing, renewing life, holding and caring for, um, offering, gifting, sharing equally, cooperation, connection, you know, those kind of qualities, those kind of values bring about a culture that's very different than we have had in the past. We've been in a patriarchal frame for a long, long time, and that brings about a certain way of being. And we've seen very clearly right now, today, we can see what that's brought. Competition, warring, fighting, destroying, forcing, changing, killing, all of these things that have happened have really not worked. And so it's not just that many of them, I think, are immoral and corrupt. It's the fact that they don't work, that they're ignorant. They're ignorant of how the world really works. And a good man, a really fine man, who is in touch with the values of the feminine that live in him as well, is a person who cares about not only his family and those around him, but understands that the harmony of the whole is what really supports his family and himself. So what's happening now is that women's values are coming forth much stronger. It's the time of the arising feminine. In 19, around 1993, primary cultures all over the world um, had ceremonies where the male elders handed the wands of power to the grandmothers, to the females and acknowledge that it was really important for these feminine values to come forward and be expressed. So as these feminine values of caring and sharing and cooperation come forward, we find different economies arising. There are economies of gifting, of making sure that everyone has everything they need, then they can offer the best they have, and everyone is enriched. And those cultures also, the feminine culture is much more deeply connected to the earth. You know, the old time cultures in Europe and other places that were uh, matrifocal, mother and child centered, uh, feminine value centered cultures were egalitarian. They were uh, very much came out of the rich understanding of the great mother that is our mother earth her body, in her beauty, in her life, that we're only a part of the family of life. And that as we step fully into the circle of that family, offering our contribution and as well stewarding and taking care of the rest of the family, then we have a beautiful life. But humans are an interesting part of the earth, uh, interesting development, because we have the capacity to change things and to dominate things in a way that's very negative. When we see our dominance as being sort of on top of the tree, 
of life, this brain, all of this is this new development in the world. Some people like to think, well, we're obviously the best and here we are and we just don't need anything else, probably. And what's really silly is what you need is the whole tree that's under you. If you don't have that, you have nothing. And so dominance, being dominant, is understanding, wow, we have a lot of impact. And how we use that impact, how we are in the world with these little hands that can do so much, including so much mischief. When we really pay attention to that, we soften ourselves into a much more uh, harmonious, easy, connected, spiritual, you know, recognizing the life of everything, honoring and respecting, as White Buffalo Woman has said to us, honoring and respecting everything in the circle of life is actually what works. When we respect and honor what's around us, we learn from them, we live with them, we recognize that you know, the flowers and the grass and the plants and the trees are what have created the possibility for us to be here as a human family. And we honor that. We recognize that. We realize that and we steward that from the place we stand, which is a dominant place. Our energy is very big and very intense. So learning to modulate that and modify it and um, you know, one of the interesting things I think that's happening is in some countries they're giving the Mother Earth a vote. They're giving the rivers and the waters a vote in their governing bodies, saying, we recognize these need to have a voice because if we don't have water, pure water, clear water, we don't have life. So those things are starting to arise. People are recognizing them and uh, realizing how wonderful a life we can have when we do live in harmony, when we live in a, uh, you know, when we renew the garden, when we reflower the garden of earth rather than destroying and, um, as Joni Mitchell says, you know, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. That's a classic statement of what we're doing in the modern world. And for me, uh, you know, the garden, uh, is paradise, the, the wild lands, the, the, the natural world, the song of birds and the, the clear streams and all the purity that was here when we came. So I think it's really vital for us as women to stand up very strongly for those values. I mean, it's, it's vital to life. We are pushing ourselves right to the edge of our ability to hit continue to live here on Earth. Because ecological crises are right, you know, right, we're dancing on the edge of those. And so for ourselves and for the world, feminine values are important. It's not about, oh, now we get to rule, we're, we get to be great, isn't it wonderful for us? It's really not about that. It's about, wow, let's bring our love and our caring and our support and our nurturing our connection to the world. Let's bring that. Let's, let's gift and offer. Let's take care of everyone. Everyone is a child of the mother. So let's take care of everyone and then we can be happy here. But if not, everyone suffers. So feminine values I think are very important and they lead, excuse me, to those gifting economies and they lead to um, to, I think, a much gentler culture, uh, to a, an egalitarian way of being. Uh, cultures that are more focused in that way work around consensus, around inviting the input of everyone, and really working until they can find a solution that everyone feels good about. One of our real challenges in the world today, and we have saw it in recent American elections, is there were like, 52% on one side and 48% on the other. And even when the election happens, they're still divided. They're still not working together. So a system where you work at it, it takes a while, you work at it and work at it and work at it until it looks like 
it's going to work for everyone. Then everyone can say, yes, yes, I can say yes to that. And I was sharing with uh, some of my students recently about the, uh, the American Constitution. Many people know that it was modeled after the Iroquois Confederacy, a native nation in the eastern part of the United States. They have an executive branch, like we do, that is, you know, moves, does the, does the doing, you might say. And then two other groups who represent the people and help make the decisions to move things forward. It was really an incredible model. But it's still, we're, we're having major challenges around all of that. And what was left out when the founding fathers of America set up that way of doing is they forgot or didn't want to institute the fact that the Senate, one of the most powerful of those two ruling bodies, is made up of the grandmothers, of the wisdom women who have done their spiritual practice over you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of time, who have deep spirit and deep wisdom, and whose dedication, when we move into the lodge of elder women, our dedication is to the whole of everything, to the children of all beings. And so to have a ruling body composed of wise women whose dedication is to all of life would be absolutely wonderful, and I'm cheering for that. You know, it's very interesting to imagine how that can be done because there are a lot of women now, I mean, almost all of us are working. We're out in the working world. But we're working in a patriarchal, uh, hierarchical, competitive kind of way. And the only way that that can be changed is for women to understand that they get the most done and feel the best, feel the happiest, are nurtured, supported, and upheld by working together. So, as in the villages of old, where the men went out hunting or working in the fields, women were together. And so, the Great Mother, the Great Creator, has given us uh, the, uh, the body and the brain that knows that working together as women is how we do things working together to support the life of everyone. And then that activity, together, not separate, that coming together to do that work gives us oxytocin and all the other things that make us feel good and happy and take down stress. Because one of the real keys these days for women, because they are so busy in the home and out in the world, the stress level is enormous. And so anything we can do to bring that stress level down in the process of all that needs to be done and the kind of activity that we're in, in the home and outside the home. So women, um, you know, women, I think, one, finding time, taking time, having their businesses give them time to take the dark of the moon and their menstrual time to quiet and deepen and refresh and renew and get healthy and uh, receive visions and creativity, bringing that back into the workplace and then working in cooperation with each other, I think that will begin to really change the form that we have. And only we women can do that. And it's kind of like jumping off the cliff because a lot of women have struggled and struggled to get to the top, you know, to be where they are, to hold, hold that position that, that is the top one and that makes the money and has the respect and all of that. But to a, for those in those kind of positions to realize that the most powerful they could be, the most intelligent thing they could do to be leaders is to start putting women together to work together. And uh, as teams of women come together and work together, um, I think over time, it's just going to take experience and time to realize that that's profoundly useful. 
And I think, too, that I see more and more now businesses are getting intelligent enough to realize that having their business work with the environment, work with caring for people, work with ser really serving people, giving people what's needed, um, actually, actually being a service, actually taking care of the earth. All of those things I think of as more feminine values. And gradually, businesses are starting to realize that, you know, it actually works. It actually works to do that. It takes maybe some time and energy to set that up and to, and to be that kind of a company. Maybe we don't make quite as much at the bottom line. But in a way, that's the top line. That money stuff is the, the sort of the top line. But when they start looking at the costs in the environment and the costs of recycling and the costs of all of these things, the real bottom line is much better when they work in cooperation with each other, work in cooperation with the world, sustainable action in the world, all of that. So I think that's really coming forward. And there are interesting things happening, too. Uh, a wonderful gal named Janine Bennis, right there in Montana, where I'm from, uh, has brought forward something she calls biomimicry. And she's starting to look at looking at the biological world and mimicking it being a way to create solutions that actually work. So they have values that are about you know, interconnection, cooperation, um, you know, intelligent obs observation and all of that. And this is a simple example. I'm sorry I don't have a better example, but let's take fibers that are made from spiders. These little tiny spiders out of their body create these incredible fibers. And when you test the strength of those for the size they are, they're way stronger than steel. They're stronger than almost anything we have in the world. So going, oh, interesting. How do they do that? What is that natural fiber that is so strong and so powerful? So starting to look at that. Of course, now chemists could or you know, get a microscope and start studying that and understanding what happened there? How did they do that? How is that created? And making things we need in our world that actually come out of natural, much more natural ways and actually function much better, mm -hmm. both in the short term and in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll address the idea of fierceness first. Fierceness is really an aspect of love. When we truly love something, we're protective of it, we're caring about it, and we're fiercely, we're fiercely involved in that, in a sense. So let's say that, um, in a way, it's like a mother bear. If someone comes to hurt that baby, she will absolutely be fierce. She will be incredibly powerful in taking care of her child. In a way, that's maybe not the best because I guess a bear could attack us, but really what I'm talking about in fierceness is not about aggression. I like to use the example of a mother dog. She has her puppies around her. And if you've ever been around a puppy, they've got enormously sharp little teeth. And they love to play. And so they're playing and having a wonderful time. And they bite their mother's ear, which really hurts. And what she does, <coughs> she gives them a very fierce and clear message. You do not do that. She's not hurting them. She's not biting or killing them. She's saying, no, 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 you do not do that. 
And that's what fierceness is, is about correcting behavior. It's about saying, this is not okay. This doesn't work. And doing that in a way that really gets your attention and wakes you up and says, this is where I draw the line. And so as we, women and others, but I think it's important for women to realize this aspect of love because Love isn't just, oh, it's so nice, everything's so sweet, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, it's great to have this loving, tender, just sweetness. And there's another part of it, which is saying, no, you do not destroy things that support my children's lives. You do not do that. No, no, no. There's a line here, and you don't cross it. You destroy the environment, you're destroying my children's lives. You destroy and damage and destroy, my children won't have anything. In America, unfortunate, terribly unfortunate kind of things happening where they're wanting to go in, even to the national parks, and drill for oil and do anything they want to do. And that will leave no beauty, no, none of the rich wildness that's so important to us for our children. It's like, no, no, no. We have not enough of that beautiful wild space now that teaches us and enriches us and nurtures us and renews our lives. No, 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 you do not destroy those things. You do not destroy things that will take eons to rebuild. And you do not pollute our waters, damage our air, grow terrible food. All of these things are places we can make a stand, and a fierce stand. And that's part of what I think about the, the feminine leadership and about, in a sense, a mother's energy. A mother doesn't say, oh, well, that's fine if you poison them just a little bit every day. It's like, you know, I, that's okay. I, or if you, you know, if you poison the air or if you, the water isn't pure or whatever. A mother that knows that would say, no, 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 you don't do that. That's not okay for my child. And that's the kind of fierceness we need. We need to step up. We women are a majority of the world. We do a lot of the buying of things, food and clothing and all, you know, so much is what we have control of. And so to fiercely vote, in a sense, with our dollars, what we buy. Um, is it organic? Is it good food? You know, who's, who's making those clothing? Are they children that are being, you know, um, enslaved in other parts of the world? I mean, is that what I want my children to wear? All of those things, to really take a very clear and sober look at those and make some choices about what's real, what's good, what's moral, and what's sustainable. Because... Should we not decide to do that? Should we not decide to fiercely act for a sustainable, respectful world that honorably harvests what we take from it, that renews and regrows and replants the garden? Uh, we won't have one, and our children won't. So the leadership of women and men with the feminine values of nurturing and cooperation and caring and taking care of the people, those things are vital. And I urge you to choose those in your life. One of the things I'm involved in that I'm very excited about is um, taking place on the ranch that now includes my home ranch where I was raised as a child. I spoke in the beginning about this amazing uh, place, the wild, beautiful place under a crystal mountain with pure water flowing out. And um, that place uh, is now called Sacred Ground. Uh, a friend of mine owns it and honors that it is my home as well. And we want to bring people there to learn from what's happening there, which is it really is white buffalo woman's work. It's about honoring everything in the circle of life. 
about giving and caring and taking care of and nurturing and stewarding and seeing how that comes back around to support our lives. And the intelligence. My friend Tana, who is the owner there, is very deeply intuitive and uh, perceptive. And she feels she receives information from all the life around, including the Buffalo Nation there, who teach her about giving and taking, nurturing and caring. Uh, they've taught her about how to renew the land there, the meadows and the fields and the mountain pastures were ruined by people overgrazing. They took herds in there and overgrazed and didn't take care of it. So when she received it from her family, it was eaten down and beaten down and not healthy. And so over the years, allowing the buffalo to be there, growing from a herd of four to now 160, they started to teach her how they work with the land. And much of what we've learned there has been expressed by a man named Alan Savory, whose holistic range management really understands how the great herds in Africa have renewed the land and can renew the land. And we're watching that happen there at sacred ground. From pastures where there's literally no grass and nothing but some kind of red strange plant that thankfully was there on the soil that was eaten down. Uh, springs were, were dead. They, there was no water running. We walked out into those pastures recently and there was grass as tall as my waist and streams, beautiful streams running that much water coming down and wildflowers and animals all over many other animals coming in, the wild animals now that have habitat. So we're learning deep lessons about respecting and honoring the earth. And there's also a kind of deeper and more subtle magic there. I don't know if I should call it subtle because it, it kind of whacks you when you get there because it really wakes you up. It doesn't allow you to, to cover up what you are and what's going on. It just brings up everything in your life. And so it's a powerful place to, to vision quest in a sense, to see yourself and to uh, not only see yourself, but also then see yourself in relationship to that incredible wild nature and the richness of what's there. So we're in the process of fundraising to create infrastructure in order to bring you there and uh, be able to have other people come and learn there. So it's a project that's very worthy of my time and energy and one that uh, I hope before long we'll be able to invite you to participate in because uh, you'll find enormous magic there as well at Sacred Ground and the old Moccasin Place, which is my home ranch, a part of that beautiful place. Walk in beauty, it's all around you. Walk in beauty, let love surround you. Walk in beauty, make it around you. Walk in beauty, with love for all. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 hey. 